And we're going to go from Romans uh, 6, verses 1 through 14 today. <clears throat> Actually, though, it'd be cool to read the whole chapter, but let's just go from verses uh, 1 through 14. I think I only have three slides on that. Uh, let's do that together. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Let's look at our message map and then we're going to pray. Today, the message is called, God baptizes us in grace and resurrects us to the newness of life. We're going to look at today how all sinners need to be saved by grace. Sort of a synopsis of Romans 1, 2, and uh, 3, uh, we're, we're, we, which we've already studied. I want to do a little synopsis on it, uh, which, which will bring us up to Romans 6, 1, give us a background to it. Uh, number two, we're going to look at how justification happens the moment of salvation. Sanctification, however, is an ongoing process that, that continually empowers us or grows us in empowerment to actually be able to obey God. Number three, we're going to look at a bunch of stuff about baptism today. We're going to see that God baptizes us in, into Christ. And there are of the eight types of baptisms that we can find in the Bible, or the eight baptisms we can find in the Bible, current believers only participate in two which assert our identity in Christ. Finally, we're going to look at, well, not finally, but we're going to look at through the law of faith, God baptizes us into grace, and he resurrects us to newness of life. Okay, let's move on. Let's pray about our word today. Lord God, we thank you for your Bible. It is an amazing, amazing book. You are so deep, so wide, so vast, and yet you come down and you fellowship with us. You have humbled yourself to be born in a manger, to, uh, to, to live a sinless life, to walk this dusty planet so that we could see what you're really like, Lord God, in human form, so that we could relate to you better. And we thank you for that. And we thank you for your word which speaks to us mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And we thank you for giving us your Bible, and we pray that you would help us to enter into the spirit that wrote it and do for us what we can't do for ourselves, God. That's abide therein. We ask you for your grace and mercy, your truth to enlighten us, your truth to invigorate us, your truth to convict us, to heal us, God, to set us on right paths. As we look at your word today, Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said. Amen. 
First thing we're going to look at today is how sinners need to be saved by grace. Each of us has from Adam an endemic, an endemic genetically transferred moral defect called the sin nature. There are a lot of acronyms for sin. Chris Hopkins has one of my favorites. Satanically insane nature. Spiritually insane, <laughs> Spiritually insane nature. <laughs> but today we're going to call it sinfully inadequate nature. From Adam we have inherited a sinfully inadequate nature. And why do I say that? Well, it's the Bible tells us that in my flesh dwells no good thing. In Romans 7.18, which we'll probably read in a couple of weeks. Jesus says in John 15.5, Apart from me, you can do no thing. You can do nothing. Therefore, we must be saved by grace. Because if in my flesh dwells no good thing, and I can't do anything on my own, doing good works does not undo our sin, nor does, do, do my paltry efforts uh, pay for the debt that I owe God for my sin. I think some of the Calvinists would call this the doctrine of total depravity. <laughs> and I think that doctrine is supposed to build our self-esteem. <laughs> Actually, it builds our God-esteem. Right? Because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. We are at our best when we understand our relationship. Uh, we understand who we are in relation to who God is. And we just saw what God, you know, He told us who we are right here. <laughs> okay? Uh, I know there's a lot of fill-ins there, so I'm, can I go on? Okay, let's move on. So the Bible asks us, given that background and who we are, the Bible asks us, are we to continue, remain, tarry, persist, on with, with sin, or are we to pers or are we persist in that which actually pursues sin? That's what we do, right? We actually pursue sin. We have an objective in mind, and we arrange our day to fulfill it. But what does God do? God actually justifies us the moment of salvation, and the rest of our Christian experience is is, is a process called sanctification which I like to think of is a process of ongoing empowerment that helps us to obey God. See, if you're focused on obeying God as opposed to overcoming your sin, I think we'll get a lot farther. So, now some people looked at this doctrine of grace. You're saved by grace. And they said, well, if that's the case, we should sin all the more because the more you sin, the more grace you get. Paul says, no, don't do that. <laughs> eh, you're a no-go at this station. You will not pass go. You will not collect $200. <laughs> you're going to jail. So, what does it mean that grace may abound? It means that it's going to increase abounding in number or quality. Anyway, the Bible says in Romans 6, 2, by no means how can we who died... And that word means how can we who are dying, we're withering and we're decaying, talking about our old sin nature, but it's also sort of a, an example of our, what's happening to our, our human bodies. The moment we're born, you know, we kind of get stronger and we grow up and then entropy and all the other, uh, the laws of thorough dynamics start setting in and we're getting older. Now, the biblical concept of dying in Christ stresses the significance of the separation that comes with divine closure. We are justified the moment we are saved. And, we're, and what God does spiritually, He closes that part of our life. It's related to the concept that stresses ending what is the former to bring what naturally should follow in the Spirit. And what, is, what follows in the Spirit? You, the moment you are justified, let's move on. The moment you are justified, God baptizes us into Christ. This is the first of the eight baptisms that are listed in Scripture. It's a spiritual thing that God does. God's spiritual baptism of the saved believer into Christ is the first baptism that we experience. 
First, it says this in Romans 6, 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, that means you were submerged, ceremonially dipped, ceremonially, ceremonially, ceremonially washed, but it's a spiritual concept at this point, undergo a cleansing by dipping or submerging. You were cleaned with water, baptized into his death. Jesus died, and when we receive that, God baptizes us into grace, into Christ's death. By grace, into Christ's death. Let me say that whole sentence. God baptizes us by grace into the death of Christ. You have died to sin. He has actually put our sin on the cross. It has been crucified with Christ. That's why the moment you are saved, you are justified. You're never going to be any more justified in God's sight, just as if you've never sinned in God's sight than you, than you are at the moment of salvation. The only thing that happens was well, a number of things that happen, but one of the things that happens is we become more spiritually sensitive to our justification. We become more aware of it. Now, being baptized into Christ in this sense is a spiritual activity that God does. It's an event that we participate in the moment of salvation. You got your feelings there. Now, what is salvation? How does that happen? Well, it happens in a three-step process. You sincerely confess you are sinners. The Holy Spirit convicts us that we're sinners. We respond to that conviction and we say, 1 John 1, 9, Yes, God, I am a sinner. And God is faithful and just to forgive. What's the basis of his forgiveness? Christ died on the cross in eternity past. In eternity now, we are saying, God, I want that death. I, I, I love you and I want the death that your son died to count for the death that I owe because of my sin. Christ our Savior is the substitute payment for our sins. So we repent and we acknowledge that Christ is not only Lord, but he's also our Savior. And we acknowledge that, yes, God, I believe that you did substitute uh, Christ for me. That when you put Christ on the cross, he was dying a substitutionary death for the, sin that the, for the debt that I owe you because of my sin. And then, if we really acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, we submit to him in a discipleship program, as explained in Hebrews 12, 4 through 8. This discipleship program is what grows us to be more like Christ. And the Bible says in that passage of Scripture, let's see if I can find it here. Hebrews 12. I thought I'd written it out here, but I guess I don't. Anyway, we're going to move on. I thought I had it in my notes so I could read it to you. I could read it on my phone. Anyway, let's go on to the second type of baptism. Did you get all those fill-ins? I know there was a lot there. The second type of baptism listed in Scripture... Well, it's really the first one listed in Scripture. Although, we, it's not really explained to us in the Old Testament. Remember, the Old Testament shows us process. The New Testament gives us um, a, a commentary and, a, 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 and an explanation of those processes. The New Testament gives us the principles that explain what was happening during the process. Well, the second baptism is Israel's baptism into Moses, which is which we, it's with the commentary on the Israelites going through the Red Sea is in 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 2, which says our fathers, it might, it might be at 1 Corinthians 10, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 3, 1 through 2. That should be a zero here, not a, but I think I got it written someplace else, do I? Nope, but it's 10. So make a, make, put a zero there in your notes. Our fathers passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. We're going to come back to this near the end of this message. We're going to come back to the baptism of Moses. So the baptism of Moses in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 2, says when the Israelites were delivered from slavery in Egypt, they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. 
That is, they were identified with Moses and the deliverance that God was bringing through him by passing through the Red Sea and following God's presence in the cloud. In Exodus 13, 21. So Paul uses this as a comparison to the way that Christians are identified with Christ and his salvation. Those who followed Moses passed through the water and were thus initiated into a new life of freedom. And also they were initiated into a new life of law keeping. Those who followed Jesus Christ, who is greater than Moses, passed through the waters of baptism and are thus initiated to a new life of freedom and grace. For the first baptism believer's experience is really done by the, uh, by the cloud. God, remember the Israelites followed a pillar of cloud by day, representing God, and a filler, pillar of cloud, a fire by, uh, by night, representing the Lord's presence with them. So, the third baptism listed in Scripture is John's baptism of repentance. John the Baptist's baptism of repentance. John the Baptist preached repentance of sins in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. He baptized people in the Jordan. Now, those who were baptized by John were, re were responding in faith, making a positive assertion that they believed his message. They also were responding to the Holy Spirit's conviction that we as people, we need to confess our sins. Conf confessing our sins is something that's very good for us to do. And they were responding to that. Do you know in Acts 18, 24 through 25, a disciple of John named Apollos preaches in Ephesus. I think it's Priscilla and Aquila who take him aside and teach him the way, meaning the way of Christ, more accurately. In Acts 19, 1 through 7, Paul encounters more followers of John. Now, these disciples had been baptized for repentance, but they had not heard of the new birth or the Holy Spirit. Paul taught them the whole message of salvation in Christ, and they received the message and were subsequently baptized in Jesus' name. They actually underwent two baptisms at that point. They probably underwent the baptism that God bring, gives to all believers spiritually, and then they got in the water with Paul. The fourth baptism listed in Scripture is the baptism of Christ himself. This was, uh, th Jesus was doing this because he wanted to identify with us. He wanted to identify with sinful humanity. Remember when he's going to get baptized, John the Baptist says, no, I, you should be baptizing me, says John the Baptist. But Jesus says, so that all righteousness can be fulfilled. I'm going to demonstrate to people what they should do if they're going to come and follow God. Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness in um, Matthew 3.15. So in this baptism, Jesus puts his stamp of approval on John's ministry of baptism. And he also comes out of the water and he begins his own ministry. As he's coming out of the water, remember the voice comes the voice of God the Father comes from heaven, the Spirit descends upon him in the form of a dove. And the voice says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so then Jesus comes out of the water under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and he begins his ministry just like we under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, begin our ministries. The fifth baptism in Scripture listed is in Matthew 3, 11 through 12. John the Baptist goes on to explain to the crowd who Christ is. And he says he's going to baptize people with fire, meaning he's going to judge the world for sin, per John 5, 22. All judgment is given to the Son. Remember we went through that last week about God's wrath and how Revelation is actually called the wrath of the Lamb? Those who are judged by Christ in the final judgment, of, which will take place in Revelation 20, verse 15, will be cast into the lake of fire. John describes Jesus as overseeing a harvest to come. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with an unquenchable fire. Matthew 13, 24 through 30, and then 36 through 43. 
The sixth baptism we see in Scripture is one that we participate in. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 says this, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now, God's eyes are too holy to look on sin, amen? So how can we, how can the Holy Spirit be in us? The moment you receive Christ, do you, do you unbecome a sinner? But the moment you receive Christ, God has justified you. You are so fully justified by the blood of Christ that His Holy Spirit can now dwell in us. God no longer, this is an amazing concept. God no longer looks at us according to our sin. Now he'll help discipline you according to your sin, but his overall posture towards you is one of justification, just as if you had never sinned. That is how durable, that is how enduring is the blood of his son. We have a deposit guaranteeing. Now, I hope we treat our deposit well. You know, the Bible says we can have a seared conscience. We can resist the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, they said, you stiff-necked people. Well, we're stiff-necked too. So although we are justified, God says, I'm going to sanctify you. Right? You've heard the expression. God says, I love you so much. I accept you as you. I'll justify you just as you are. But I love you too much to have you miss my blessings and live in your sinful nature as if nothing else matters. As if, nothing, as if justification never happened to you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter you into a discipleship program which we call theologically sanctification. So that your earthly walk can begin to approximate your spiritual position. Right? We are seated and raised in the heavenlies, it tells us in Ephesians. That's a great book. You know, when I was first saved, I must have read the book of Ephesians. I, got, I read the Gospels dozens of times. And then I read the book of Ephesians probably 20 times. Because I was doing some things. I need to learn spiritual warfare and my position in Christ and all this stuff. And the Lord began to liberate me. He liberated me more and more. You've got to read His Word. How do we know who God is? It's in His Word. You can't have a religion that calls itself Christianity apart from God's Word. Otherwise, you've just got, perhaps, pagan religion in the name of Christianity. Not going to help us. It really, really, really feels good to be set free in Christ. Okay. So, now, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, this baptism that God does in heaven... Which, which is sort of um, verified, reflected in our, in, in our baptism of the Holy Spirit. Which, without that, we really are nowhere, right? Because in my flesh dwells no good thing. So I, I can't live in my flesh, I have to live by the Spirit. So at the moment of salvation, where we are justified in Christ, God looks at where he's too holy to look on sin. He no longer looks, at, looks on us as sinners. He imbues us with the power of the Holy Spirit. And guess what that initiates? A bunch of things. Number one, it initiates us into the body of Christ. I remember being a sinner. I was still a sinner, but I mean, when I was a, a, a young, when I was newly saved. And sometimes you could smell my sin on me. <laughs> A guy told me, he goes, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to church. He goes, man, those people don't want somebody like you in church. I said, probably not. <laughs> but I said, God wants me there. And I'm, I care more now about what God thinks about me than what people think about me. And so I'm going to church. You know, Satan tells us stuff like that to keep us from becoming part of the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit anoints us to be part of the body of Christ. And so we listen to the world and we neglect the assembling of ourselves together. 
so we, we sort of begin stiff-necked people to resist the Holy Spirit that wants you to assemble together. All right, what else happens when we get baptized in the Holy Spirit? Well, God gives us some gifts, doesn't he? You know, this is my personal belief. I believe that the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives you are consistent with the way God has wired you. And what, before, we have the, before we are in Christ, the things that we are doing are sort of an example of, of the direction in which our life wa God wa wants our life to go. I don't mean he wants you in the bar sinning, but there are things that you think about that God will turn that into a, God, into a godly uh, way. All my life I wanted to be a gang leader. I thought that'd be the coolest thing. And now you are. That's not We should turn the camera around. Look at these sinners. <laughs> and and then you know, I fainted uh, in junior high school. I fainted in front of my entire school assembly, singing at a concert one day. And when I got up from there, I said, I'm never going to do this again. Oh. And in junior high school, I mean, I was probably a short kid. And um, I could sing almost as high as any girl. And I could sing not quite as low as the, the, the baritone boys, but I could sing. So they, they discovered that and they put me, I was a short kid. And I'm standing next to these big guys and these big girls, the big sopranos. You know, when you're, when you're in junior high school, the kids look like, the guys look like they're 10 and the girls look like they're 20, right? So, you know, and I couldn't get any air. And I fainted in front of my whole school assembly. And my friends told me, they said, you were doing this. And boys flew off the riser down at that end. And then you went this way and girls flew off the riser down at that end. And I got up from there and I said, I'm never going to be in pump. Never am I ever, ever, ever going to speak, let alone sing, in public. And I was in a chapel in Germany one day. And all these German rock guys and whatnot had gotten saved, and Americans, had, and they were all playing guitars and whatnot. And they were like, well, I can't do this in church. I'm like, why not? And they said, oh, man, if I pick up that guitar in public, I'll just start chasing girls. And, they, and they said, that's what the guitar is for me. I can't do this. They said, you should do this for us. I said, you got to be out of your mind. But I wasn't going to tell them that I fainted in front of my junior high school. I had every excuse in the world why I am not going to join the church worship team. Chaplain comes in, he goes, what are you guys talking about? And uh, they, well, we're trying to get Earl to play the guitar. He sings, you know, he's got a voice and blah, blah, blah. And I don't think I sing that great anyway, but I sing much better hanging out with Donna. But anyway, so... <laughs> The, um, and the, the chaplain gets a guitar off the wall and he says, why don't you hold on to this for a couple of months and if you like it, then go buy your own, hang this one back up. But if you don't like it, no harm, just go hang it back up. So I started following these guys around trying to learn to play the guitar. God wired me to do that when I was a child. In my sinful nature, I walked away from it and said, nope, I'm not doing that. The Holy Spirit comes into your life one day. One of the, I, this went on for months. One day, my, my, the guy that led me to Christ, he says to me, Earl, are you telling God no, or have you asked the Lord what he wants you to do? I said, well, obviously the answer is no. <laughs> and he goes, not to us. And I finally fessed up. I said, look, I fainted in front of my whole junior high school. I can't be in public doing this. It's not going to go well. And he goes, do you think the Holy Spirit would have you faint now? I said, well, well, you know, I hope not. <laughs> All right, so we move on. The baptism of the cross. In Mark 10, 35-39, Jesus referred to his impending suffering on the cross as a baptism. You know, the sons of thunder, uh, 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 James and John, they come to Jesus and they say, hey, we want a, great, you know, a position in your kingdom. And, um, and he goes like, well, you're, can you suffer the baptism that I'm about to suffer? And they go, well, we can do that. I'm sure they didn't have any clue, right? And uh, so um, Jesus replied to them, okay, you will. But your position in the kingdom is going to be decided by my father, not by, not by us. 
All right, number eight, the eighth baptism is the water baptism of the believer. We also participate in that. We get baptized in the water as a reflection of what God does for us spiritually when we're saved. In Romans 6, 3 through 4, it explains and it illustrates these amazing spiritual truths. Being submerged and emerging from the water is like being buried with Christ and resurrected to your new life. It's a display that we want to make to the, it's, it's, a, what, it's a testimony that we want to make to the world of what God has done in our hearts and in our lives. So the Bible says all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Of the seven baptisms, we only really participate in two. I mean, God does baptize us spiritually. But then we get baptized in the Holy Spirit, which probably motivates us to get baptized physically. Right? The Bible says that none can say that Jesus is Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? So, now, based upon what we just read, oh, no, no, let's, I, got it. I got to set up one more thing before I give you our, our open book test. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Now, let's go back to, God, to God's baptism uh, is a reflection of the safety that we experience upon salvation. We got to look at the Old Testament to do this. There's two baptisms in the Old Testament, in a sense. There's the baptism of Moses, and there's the baptism of the ark, Noah's ark. So, 1 Peter 3.20 tells us this, God patiently waited in the days of Noah, the ark took about 120 years to build, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Now, when God baptizes us spiritually, we don't get wet. In the baptism of Moses, the Israelites, let's, well, let's answer some questions. Israel, Israel's baptism in Moses, it says in 1 Corinthians, this should be a 10 again, our fathers passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. Well, well we, got, we got Noah, we got Moses. Let's, ask some, let's answer some questions. During Noah's flood, were the eight people who were saved, were the eight people saved, A, baptized in the rainwaters before they entered the ark? No. no. They were saved before they entered the ark. There was no rain. There was no rain anyway. Okay, good. Boy, good, good theologian here. All right. Now, B, were they baptized in the flood waters when they left the ark? No. no. So, baptism doesn't save you, does it? No. Baptism is something that happens after salvation. Right? We, God justifies us and he baptizes us into Christ. We don't even know what's happening. All right, now let's talk about when they were crossing the Red Sea. The people saved, were they baptized in the sea before God split the waters? No. Did, were they baptized in the sea after they crossed over? No. Baptism doesn't save us. Baptism is, is something that happens after salvation. Is that a long way to go to make that point? That baptism does not save us. Right? God saves us. The cross saves us. We are saved through the cross. Baptism is, uh, as, lo as, 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 lo as, as far as we are earthly concerned, baptism is something that takes place after we are saved. Now, God in the heavenlies baptizes us into Christ, probably around the moment of salvation. That's, and we're justified and baptized all at once, I guess. So, so in baptism, let's move on. We assert, why do we physically go to the, down to the river and get baptized? Because we are physically asserting our identification with Christ. We know that he died, so we are going to symbolize that we're going to get buried with him. Romans 6, 12 through 14 says this, let not, therefore, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present, bring, come up to, and stand by your sinful members to sin as instruments, implements, or tools for unrighteousness. What's unrighteousness? It's violations of God's commandments. But present, bring, come up to, and stand by yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments or implements, tools for righteousness. What is righteousness? It's compliant with God's commands. It's compliant with, the, with the, what we're taught on the Sermon of the Mount. It's compliant with the Beatitudes. For sin will not have dominion, won't have authority, lordship, or do it jurisdiction to rule over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. 
We're under God's favor, God's kindness, which was extended to us when Christ gave himself away to become surety by taking responsibility for our underperformance in God's eyes, which we call sinning against God, for which Christ submitted himself as payment of the debt we owe. Now, how did he do that? We did five things. Number one, he was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died a substitutionary death. He is bodily resurrected, and he's seated at the right hand of God. You know, I had these in your notes, but I wanted to give you one. I had to take them out. I didn't have room for them. But you should write this down. People who claim to be Christians, if you don't believe these five things, you are not a biblical Christian. You, you are not a Christian according to, according to what God says. So all these people who say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe this. Or well, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe Jesus would live this. I'm a Christian, but I don't believe. What activates grace? Faith. If you don't believe, you get no grace. If you don't believe, you're trapped in the law of works. You think you can keep it all? You're going to fall short. Even the people that swear they can keep it. My uh, Islamic friends and my Jewish friends, they have said to me, well, we're doing all these things that God commanded them. We're right in his eyes when we do these things. And I'm like, okay, so suppose you get to heaven and your bad outweighs your good. And you haven't done enough to overcome the bad so that you can get some things in the good column. They all say, well, I want God to forgive me. I want him to let me in anyway. And I go like, why? And they'll say, because we were sincere. And I'm like, well, can you be sincerely wrong? I'm sure, well, criminals are sincere also. People who beat their spouses feel justified in doing so. Next slide. We're going to end with, with this. We lose under the law of works, but we obtain good from God through grace that resurrects us to the newness of life. What happens under the law of works? Law of works, you can take your chances or you can just get under God's grace, all right? Let's, let's talk about taking our chances. The law of works provides one. We've already studied this, right, in, in, the, in the early part of Romans. It gives you the ability to boast or self-exalt or brag. James 4, 6, 1 Peter 5, uh, 1 Peter 5, 5 tells us that God resists the proud. So if you proudly think you can keep that law, you're already being resisted by God. And keeping the law is an act of our flesh, and it, in my flesh dwells no good things. Apart from Christ, I could do nothing. So it's going to be fruitless anyway. All right. All right. When you want to be under the law, you get wages that are commensurate with your performance. Grace gives you what you don't deserve. Mercy doesn't. Mercy gets you out from under what you deserve. Uh, under the law, we have the inability to become perfect. We can't be completely sanctified unless you lie to yourself and you're self-deceived. We risk a delusional sense of self-righteous fulfillment. You know, theologically speaking, grace is like a huge, huge, huge boulder. It has theological weight. Works are like puffs of smoke. All right, now the law of faith operates by God operates by us believing and glorifying in what, God, what Christ has done for us. That's why you have to believe those five things. The law of faith operates by, though we are ungodly, we receive imputed, credited righteousness and justification. You should go watch last week's message because we had the, what was it, two weeks ago? We had the, plus, we had the chart on, on Abraham and David, what was in their sin column and how God imputed righteousness to them. The law of faith operates by, we, by us receiving assurance and conviction that God's promises are true. The law of faith works by setting us free from working to be righteous. Through the law of faith, God baptizes us into grace and he resurrects us to new life. Amen? Let's prepare for communion. How much time do we have? What time is it? We're supposed to end at like quarter off? Uh, 
chapter 6, 54, those eat my flesh and drink my blood. What? Now, I, I give it to you in a bunch of different verses here. Whoever lead, feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. You know, because Jesus said this, uh, early people called Christians Campbells. Look at the King James, whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. No American standard. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Hmm. If I don't eat and drink, I don't get raised. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, NIV, has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. NLT. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise, him, raise that person up on the last day. Hmm. Now, let me give you some overviews of what the historical body of Christ has said about these scriptures. It can be summarized. F team, F, F, uh, Myers says this. Christ is referring to the saving efficacy, efficacy of his spiritual eating and drinking. I'm going to summarize all this by saying this. i got like 20 commentaries here, but I'm going to, I'm going to just summarize it. What does he mean by this word, eat my flesh? is a word that means it has to pass through your teeth. It has to be consumed. It has to be masticated, which is the first step of digestion, chewing. In other words, Jesus is saying, I want you to apply what I give to you like it's food that's going to be digested into your system and it's going to become part of you. Now, why does he use such a strong term? He's not saying we should nibble. He's also not saying that we should sniff test things. It's Christianity. He is saying, I want you to sink your teeth into this thing. I want you to chew on, masticate, ruminate on me and what I am and what I mean to you for the whole of your eternal existence depends on how you deal with me, how you respond to me, how you submit to me, how you take in and appropriate me. This is what communion is about. And I will raise him up on the last day, not the lake of fire for us, eternal life. So to summarize, Jesus is saying, apply what I give you and consume it and let it become part of you. That's what it means to eat my flesh and drink my blood. It's a spiritual thing. Much like, much like us getting baptized upon salvation. That God actually baptizes us into Christ and justifies us at the moment of salvation. 